Welcome everyone. We are just waiting while people join the webinar. So please just give us a few moments and then we'll get started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We're just giving people a few moments to join the webinar um, and we'll get started in just a moment. Thank you. People are still coming in, so we're going to give them another moment or two and then get started. Um, thank you for your patience. People are still joining, but I'm going to, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Nadia Rubai. I'm one of the co-directors of the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention, or IGMAP, at Binghamton University in the state of New York. Um, along with my fellow co-director, Max Pensky, who's also co-moderating today, I want to thank you for joining us this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, um, depending on where you are. Before we begin, um, it's important that we take a moment to acknowledge that Binghamton University sits on the ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee people, taken by force from the Onondaga and Oneida, and that as we talk today in, um, in the webinar about the need for rigorous investigative reporting of atrocities in all parts of the world, we cannot and should not ignore the need to report on past and ongoing atrocities committed against Indigenous peoples, from which many of us continue to benefit. Today's webinar, as you know, is on investigative journalism at the atrocity front line. And it's in the form of a conversation with two extremely experienced journalists who may not define their work as atrocity prevention, but whose work clearly contributes to warning of impending violence, exposing atrocities in real time, and challenging impunity. And they do this despite facing growing, growing challenges to how they do their work, given the changes in the environment in which reporting and journalism take place. Nick Terse is an investigative reporter, a fellow at the Type Media Center, the managing editor of TomDispatch.com, and a contributing writer at The Intercept. He's the author most recently of Next Time They'll Come to Count the Dead, War and Survival in South Sudan, as well as the New York Times bestseller, Kill Anything That Moves, The Real War in Vietnam which received a 2014 American Book Award. He's reported from the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and Africa, 
and written for the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Harper's Magazine, and Vice News, among other publications. Nick joins us today from just across the hall in our IGMAP conference room. He's been a visiting practitioner with us all week. Joining us from a little farther away, um, we're so excited to welcome Maria Reza from the Philippines. Maria has been a journalist in Asia for 35 years. She co-founded Rappler, the top digital only news site that's leading the fight for press freedom, freedom, excuse me, press freedom in the Philippines. Before founding Rappler, Maria focused on investigating terrorism in Southeast Asia. She opened and ran CNN's Manila Bureau for nearly a decade before opening the network's Jakarta Bureau, which she ran from 1995 to 2005. She wrote Seeds of Terror, an eyewitness account of Al-Qaeda's newest center of operations in Southeast Asia, and From Bin Laden to Facebook, 10 Days of Abduction, 10 Years of Terrorism. As Rappler's CEO and president, Maria has endured um, repeated harassment, constant political harassment, and repeated arrests by the Duterte government. She's been forced to post bail 10 times to stay free, and Rappler's battle for truth and democracy is the subject of the 2020 Sundance Film Festival documentary, A Thousand Cuts. If you haven't yet watched this, you need to. For her courage and her work on disinformation and fake news, Maria was named Time Magazine's 2018 Person of the Year, was among its 100 most influential people of 2019, and has also been named Time Magazine's most influential women of the, woman of the century. She has received many other honors from international organizations, and I could go on and on, but I know you all came here to listen to a conversation um, with our panelists, not lengthy biographies of them. So for those who are not familiar with the IGMAP webinar format, there are no PowerPoint slides and our panelists will not be making presentations. We will be having a conversation with them and then we will take questions from all of you. You may submit your questions at any time using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. When you submit a question, please identify yourself providing us with your name and organizational affiliation. And we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, I'd also note that Maria has another obligation starting at 10 p.m. her time, and thus is with us only for the first hour. As such, we're going to have a general conversation with both Nick and Maria for about 40 minutes, then take some of your questions with particular attention to those directed to Maria, followed by perhaps another 15, 20 minutes of discussion with Nick, and then more time for your questions, um, specifically those directed to him. So Max, do you want to get us started? I would love to. First of all, let me join Nadia in thanking both Nick and Maria for joining us from opposite sides of the planet at the moment. And thank you for uh, our online audience for joining us as well. And, and you are also a, a global audience with, with a lot of different global concerns. So one of the ways I thought we could jump right in is, is, is to um, note that both Nick and Maria, although their work is different in many ways, both of them, uh, their work and the work of, of Rappler and of Intercept and Tom Dispatch and other online news sources that Nick works for, have been engaged for, for years now in reporting on uh, what governments call wars, which is to say uh, uh, the, the, the American global war on terror, uh, the war on terror as it's been um, understood by the Philippine government, the war on drugs, um, and in both cases, these wars um, amount to, in many respects, uh, the lethal use of government uh, force against um, unarmed civilians. Now, uh, one of the things that I'd love to hear from both of our panelists is that uh, you could say that both of those American and those Filipino wars may be um, reaching something of an inflection point right now. In the Philippines, Duterte's lethal war on drugs and, and war on terror is, is, is um, coming up to what looks like the end of the Duterte administration and national elections, uh, which are now in their early phases. And for Nick, um, the, uh, the end of the American mission in, in Afghanistan, certainly, and it's the, the catastrophic end of that mission, certainly may also mark a certain inflection point in this, in this forever war. So one thing to ask Nick and, and Maria just to speak to is, from your position as investigative journalists, what, what do you see as the current situation and the, and the near future of these forever wars in both of your countries? 
Maria, can I start with you? I was, I was going to pass to Nick. Um, first, thank you for having me. You know, it, it, it's it's really good to be here. I think we cover the world between us. I, uh, you know, the quick answer I would say. Um, the two biggest stories of my career always involved having the Philippines be the testing ground for attacks against the United States. And inevitably, it is the way the United States responds that impacts what happens in my country, like in Southeast Asia. 9-11 um, was a plot that I first, when 9-11 when happened, it was a memory for me because it was in intelligence documents, interrogation reports of probably the first pilot who was recruited by a group that would later be called Al-Qaeda. His name was Abdul Hakim Murad. He was arrested in the Philippines in 1995 in a plot to assassinate the Pope. And they came up with the Bojinka plot, but in his interrogation report then, he, he talked about a plot to bring down uh, buildings, use hijacking planes and crashing them into buildings. That's like kind of the, the wording of what he said. And, and he named the World Trade Center, the Sears building in Chicago, the, a, a few others that weren't at the Pentagon. So that, and, you know, and then of course his, he was with Ramsey Youssef who had just come back from 1993 after the World Trade Center, the failed truck bombing in 1993, he came back to the Philippines, trained the Abu Sayyaf. His uncle Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was here in 1994. They tested how to get through airport security through Manila airports because we have the same, because we were, were an American ally, we have the same equipment. And now fast forward to, to today and it almost feels like similar tactics because tracking terrorists became, uh, I started learning social network analysis. First, the law enforcement will call it link analysis and then social network analysis. Well, fast forward that to disinformation networks or what the Russians, um, well, major powers would call it uh, influence or operations or information operations. And um, what we found in the Philippines in 2016, uh, and we ex this is part of the reason we, we got attacked, was that information operations were exploiting the weaknesses of American social media platforms, American companies, and they were essentially uh, attacking um, the public, insidiously manipulating public opinion. And, you know, I, I wound up being a target of that early on, seeding meta narratives, journalist equals criminal, that comes a lie told a million times, comes bottom up, and then President Duterte then came top down and, and so on. And then the law, once he took office, uh, the corruption of the institutions, it was turned against the journalists, human rights activists, opposition politicians. Um, what a long answer. I, I, I will shut up and, and just say that what have we learned and will it continue? I think the biggest battle that we face, and it isn't just the Philippines, um, is I became a journalist because I, I believe information is power. And slowly we've seen technology disrupt everything. Well, in the last five or six years since 2014, 2015, because you saw in 2014, the impact of information operations in the Ukraine, right? This is the beginning of it. And then you had it uh, in, in the 2016 elections in the United States. Um, we began to see that an atom bomb, this, I always say this, an atom bomb has exploded in our information ecosystem. And we haven't acknowledged it. We believe it's still the same, but it requires the same kind of multilateral, multinational, multi-stakeholder initiative globally to be able to, um, to this is like one, it's like the post-World War II, post-Hiroshima moment. The world needs to come together. We can't just leave it to the United States or to the European Democracy Action Plan because what the social media platforms have proven is that humanity has far more in common than we have differences of, of culture and state lines because we are being manipulated in the same way by the same platforms. So you've heard it from Francis Hogan uh, on, on Tuesday. Um, 
these the it's the algorithms of distribution. Mm -hmm. It is the way it divides us and radicalizes. Sorry, so long. It was oh, it was just so much. Great. So I will take it. <laughs> no, Nick, please. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Nick, please. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. And, and it's uh, it's also such an honor to, to share this virtual stage with Maria. Uh, you know, you asked about this being a inflection point uh, in you know the the global war on terror, or what we've known as the global war on terror for years. And I, I think I, I I think we might be, or uh, the Biden administration is at least trying to uh, to tell us that we are. You know, there there is a move away, it seems, from these big footprint wars, uh, actual withdrawal from Afghanistan a rebranding of the war in, in Iraq. There's still US troops on the ground, but miraculously they've changed from, uh, from combat troops to trainers. Now, uh, you know, whether that's uh, true or not, and whether you can distinguish between the, the two is uh, up for debate. But you know, the Biden administration has been pushing this idea for months now of uh, what they're calling over the horizon warfare. And uh, they're they're claiming it's a new form of warfare, pinpoint form, surgical strikes, uh, over the horizon, meaning that uh, this is remote and no boots on the ground. Now, when White House spokesperson Jen Psaki has talked about it, she's named countries like Libya, Somalia, uh, Yemen. Uh, Libya, there might not be any troops on the ground right now, but I know for a fact there are uh, U.S. troops on the ground right now in Yemen and Somalia. They're very much on the horizon, not over it somewhere. And uh, and it's tough to figure out how this uh, how you can distinguish over the horizon warfare from remote warfare that we've seen for the last 20 years in those same countries, in Libya, in Yemen, in Somalia, uh, also in Iraq and Afghanistan, Syria, and you know, the, the final moments of the U.S. war in Afghanistan, uh, you know, the last U.S. strike after 20 years of warfare was uh, an attack on what the United States said was a uh, ISIS-K, uh, isis Khorasan group suicide bomber who was about to attack the airport, kill U.S. troops, kill Afghans. And the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, came out and said that this was a, a righteous strike and uh, unlike most drone strikes that have taken place for the last 20 years, there were lots of reporters around because it took place in the heart of Kabul. Uh, there was a New York Times team on the ground headed by uh, Matt Akins, Matthew Akins, and he went to the site the very next day and the official military narrative began to unravel. Uh, you know, this, this ISIS-K terrorist turned out to be uh, uh, Afghan civilian who worked for an American uh, NGO. Uh, he was going about his normal daily activities, uh, looked at from across the globe, uh, from the camera on a drone. The Americans thought it was malevolent activity, but if they had observed him instead of for eight hours, for eight days, or for the, the previous 80 days, they would have found this was the exact route that he always took through town, that the uh, explosives that they thought he was loading into his car were actually jugs of water because once the Taliban took over, water was cut off in his neighborhood. And, you know, this, this tells you the perils of so-called over the horizon or remote warfare. Uh, once the strike was taken, the United States said that, that this was a model strike and the way that they, they would conduct the war. And this was, uh, you know, the exact way that you would conduct over the horizon warfare. Now they've tried to back away from that because it turned out to be such a disaster. But so I, I think that we're at that point now. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a question of, of which way these conflicts go. Thank you. So, um, Maria, you talked about uh, the how the Philippines it kind of becomes this test case um, for what will subsequently happen elsewhere, and particularly in the United States. And we have many examples of this. And we know that um, Facebook called Philippines patient zero for um, digital disinformation. And if we learn nothing um, from the past 18 to 20 months with the COVID pandemic, um, we know how rapidly a vi virus can spread from patient zero to um, a global um, reach. 
Um, so where do you see the greatest risks now? And this question is again for both of you. And, and what strategies do you see that the, the mainstream traditional media is using or how the how journalists are using the social media space to more effectively um, address the escalation of disinformation, particularly the disinformation that legitimates um, mass atrocity violence, whether by state actors or encourages it on the part of, of civilian actors? Uh, I think there's three strands I kind of want to pull from that, that great question. Uh, I think the first is that what the, what flows through the pipe. So if you think about social media, these tech platforms as you know the, the world's largest distributor of news, that's what Facebook is. YouTube is number one now in terms of delivery of video, right, globally. So um, if you think about what travels fastest because of the way the algorithms have been set up, because they are built around a model of keeping your attention, and the way to keep your attention is, is anger and outrage that hit, hit you, like use your biology. I think it was an American um, uh, biology professor, um, E.O. Wilson, who said, the greatest crisis we face is our paleolithic emotions, our medieval institutions, and our godlike technology. So this, this surge of violence, online violence doesn't stay online. And so what we have seen is as this pumps up, as the platform, as these platforms make more money, the violence increases. And what we've seen from 2017 to, to 2021 is an increase in these cheap armies on social media, tearing down democracies in different parts of the world, my country being one of them. But I think beyond that is it, it makes all of us doubt the facts. Right? So imagine our journalism is being distributed by a platform that is biased against facts and is biased against journalists. Um, hand in hand with them, we haven't really talked about this that much, but I'm hoping that after the testimony at the Senate that we begin to talk not about content, but about the algorithms, because hand in hand with that is the commodification of journalism, right? If the metric that is used in the age of the internet is page views, you know, I know I ran the largest network television network in the Philippines. I know that what rates the highest are crime stories and entertainment stories. That's pretty much the same all around the world. But I never fill our primetime newscast with crime and entertainment because if you do, um, it goes against the mission of journalism. But the new, we've lost our gatekeeping powers and the new gatekeepers don't have those same um mission to protect the public sphere. I think that's, that's, the, that's first. Um, the second one is that technology has changed everything. Nick talked a little bit about warfare, right? But technology has changed everything. And, and I think that, you know, as we're dealing with the information ecosystem and this godlike technology insidiously manipulating our biology, uh, you have lots of other parts, technology of warfare that has changed, right? It's, it's a trial and error. And the, these phrases that have come up since the war on terror began, collateral damage, the dehumanization, this is how you get mass atrocity. So you pump your information ecosystem with, with violence and hate, us against them. And then you have these, these tech, the technology that can, can actually make it happen. So anyway, I, I, I'll stop there. I feel like uh, this is, this is for, for it. so let me just say in the existential part, because I used that a lot in the last few years, but I feel like with our elections coming up, the end of six years of Rodrigo Duterte, where we did have no idea how many people have been killed in a brutal drug war. It ranges from thousands to tens of thousands to almost 27 to 30,000 in less than three years. We have no idea how many people have been killed, but after the end of six years of that, right, we're facing an elections in May that will determine whether we stay a democracy or not. And I just can't imagine having integrity of elections, having people be able to vote based on facts when 
you know, the, the book by Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, when we are not thinking at all, we are being stimulated emotionally. And, and I see that all throughout. How do we have discussions to prevent atrocity if we're not thinking? This is my greatest worry. It's tough to follow that. Um, but, you know, it, it got me thinking a lot about the uh, sort of the toxic information ecosystem that I've seen sometimes come on the ground in, in Africa. Uh, you know, one of the, the main methods of uh, distributing information, misinformation and disinformation is, uh, is WhatsApp, uh, you know, which is a, a Facebook owned, uh, you know, uh, text app. Uh, but it's, it's also used to distribute uh, images, uh, video, and you know I would find that in uh, conflict zones, conflict environments, there'd be uh, a great deal of uh, of content that was shared that was designed to inflame sentiments or to uh, inflame ethnic tensions uh, in a in a conflict zone, and you know there there's a uh, now, I, I think this is going on all over the world, but in Africa right now, there's a, a very unique, um, it's a, a weekly Pan-African publication now called The Continent. I've written for them a few times and you know they've decided to take the fight right to the front line, which is it's WhatsApp and they also use Signal now to distribute. Um, they wanted to go where the disinformation was, the misinformation and put, uh, you know, counter information out there, uh, high quality journalism, well vetted, bite sized, and designed for the app itself. Uh, smaller articles or the full issue is uh, is done in PDF format, so it makes it much easy, uh, much more difficult to uh, track it in countries where you know they're uh, inter using signals intelligence interception. Uh, you don't, you're not able to, you know, use it like it was. Uh, you know, the, the text isn't within WhatsApp, it's in the PDF there. So you can sort of transmit it across borders, if you will, uh, where it's not gonna be picked up. And, you know, I think, I think these are the strategies that we can use to, uh, to try and, you know, battle on the, on the front lines in this information war. And, uh, you, know, you know, people like Maria are out there every day fighting this fight, but, uh, you know, it is, it is going on around the world other places and, and uh, I, I think it's it's necessary that uh, you know to, to find the institutions and the resources to uh, to, to fund these ventures and to uh, you know pr provide this lifeline. One of the things that strikes me as I'm listening to, to both of your responses is if we think about the, the general public as being um, motivated, to give greater attention and to action by anger and outrage. How do you deal with the situations when your reporting ought to generate outrage and you know, these bombshell revelations? Um, you know, for example, Nick, your, your whole um, reporting from the Democratic Republic of, of Congo that you documented in FICE should have generated global outrage and response. And, and Maria, when you had the 2015 interview with then um, mayor of Davao, um, Rodrigo Duterte, before he was elected president, he admitted face to face with you that he not only authorized, but engaged in killings. How do we reconcile that outrage and anger is what drives the public and yet they also seem to be able to um, just ignore things that should drive outrage. I, I can go, I can jump in first. So, so I think the, so let's start first with just pace, right? Uh, it, everything moves much, much faster now. And, and again, I'll go back. Sorry, you can tell I really, social media for me is where I live, right? So if you look, we're hyper socialized in, in the real world, there's six degrees of separation that, that we know, but in the virtual world, in Facebook world, it's 3.5 degrees. So you actually compress, right? In addition to that, so you're hyper socialized, you, you, the virality is faster. The actors themselves actually cannot, uh, they don't have the same time. This is not 
at a human pace. So I would hate to be a politician today having to respond as quickly as you have to, even if you don't have all the facts. It's, it's, it's been really greatly compressed. Um, and then finally, I'll add the third part, which is actually, I'll add two more. The third is the impact on journalists, right? We're, far, we're in these fragmented spaces where in the old world, like the, I'm a traditional broadcast journalist, that's how I grew up. In that world, when the pace of change was slower, right? One, one news uh, organization will pick up a story and then you know it breaks in the New York Times and CNN picks it up and then the Washington Post grows it and then NPR picks it up, The Intercept pulls another part. And we begin to see a whole story because the public sphere is open. Today, it doesn't happen quite that way because we're off in different distribution platforms. And depending on you know, which side of the political divide you are in the United States or in the Philippines, you know, depending on which echo chamber you've been pulled into, and this is an active pulling into by the algorithms of the platform that delivers the news, you don't see any of that stuff. And then I'll end with this thing here in the Philippines, right? When you're with a government that, that puts pressure on journalists to conform to the stories it wants to tell, uh, you break a story, you're not gonna get other news organizations building the story. So I, I'll, I'll give a, an example of two stories that you, know, you just sit there and you go, how do I stay a journalist in today's day and age? Um, uh, there's a, we spent eight months working with OCCRP the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, uh, to find the links of corruption. Going from President Duterte to his Chinese advisor, Michael Yang, to his uh, special aide, uh, Bongo, who is now a senator, and then to the fourth, the guy who actually cut the deal. This is now a massive Senate investigation. When we did the story, we just, we realized the time for other news organizations to pick it up isn't there. It's not competitive in that same way anymore, but news groups don't quite get to that point yet. We dumped all the documents into the public sphere it, that took us eight months because it needed to. And it wasn't necessarily the journalists that picked it up as much as the senators who were handling the corruption investigation. That's one, right? So it, investigations into corruption become more difficult. The Pandora Papers is the second investigation, collaborative investigation we did. All of this isn't within like the span of weeks. This one was with ICIJ and, um, and the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism. But here's the hard part. It's a gray area, these offshore, the Pandora Papers are about offshore accounts. And you know it's a very gray area because the wealthy could just put their money in offshore accounts. Uh, the, the implicit assumption is that they there could be tax avoidance in something like that, or it could be completely legal, but those offshore accounts are also where criminal activity happens. So the Pandora Papers has come out, but here's what happens. The government is mad at us. And then when we do the Pandora Papers, the, the wealthy, the power and money also gets mad at us. So what do you do as a journalist in, an organ, in a country like that where you're trying to fight to survive? Um, it's a long answer because this is something that we've been we've been struggling with. But I think what this means is, you know, journalists are in a different place. Um, it is not the way it was when I first became a journalist. Our business model has crumbled. Our audience is fragmented and angry in a whole other way. We cannot work in the old way. Like the kind of work that Nick does when he goes into uh, Afghanistan requires a lot more um, a lot more money, a lot more resources. When I was with CNN, that was much easier to do. When it's fragmented, the large networks are not going to put that much money into it. Or if they do, it's much less. So what that means is you're gonna get less information. And then the second part is, are you gonna get the easy ones? Are you really gonna get the story? Are, is democracy going to get the kind of journalism it needs to keep power? accountable. Yeah, I'm, I run into these problems that Maria's talking about all the time. I mean, a, a lot of times it does come down now to, to resources. And you know, in the United States, uh, 
you know, publications, they are increasingly less interested in uh, covering a conflict uh, like in the, the Democratic Republic of Congo in South Sudan, where there isn't uh, this perceived uh, uh, United States news hook, uh, something that's going to make Americans care about this. Uh, I think, uh, you know, journalists are always uh, making the case that, you know, it's it's our job to, to make the readers care. And if you invest the resources, uh, you know, in, in these projects, uh, you know, readers will find worth in it. And there is a reason to tell these stories. There is a legitimate reason to put a spotlight on an ethnic cleansing campaign in the Democratic Republic of Congo or in the, the South of South Sudan. So it actually does have reverberations. And a lot of times, if you look, if you peel back the layers, you'll find that there, you know, there, there often is uh, you know, uh, other great powers involved, uh, often a, a US news angle there. But it takes the resources to, to dig into these things. They're not easy stories to tell. And you know, as Maria was saying, this is such a, a challenging media environment. Uh, you know, it's it's fractured for, you know, a, a couple decades now. I think we've been trying to find, you know, the uh, the funding mechanism. Um, you know, and and a, a lot of a lot of things have been tried, and uh, you know, a lot haven't panned out. You've had a lot of uh, journalism outfits that have have uh, come and gone. They've they've had a lot of cash at one point through venture capital or, uh, you know media uh, conglomerations, but then you know, they're, they're flash in the pan and they disappear. Uh, you know, we need to figure out ways to build really strong, lasting uh, journalistic, uh, journalistic institutions for this current age. And I think, you know, Rappler is, is one of these where, where we can see they, they built up from, uh, you know, uh, uh, using social media uh, to begin with, one of the, the innovators there. Uh, building it into, you know, a, a burgeoning media empire. So it's, uh, you know, we have to be innovative, but uh, I, I think we need, uh, we're going to need help in, in doing this. And, uh, you know, uh, whether it's uh, academic institutions or uh, donors somewhere, we're going to have to find a model uh, so that people can get uh, the information they need uh, to, to exist in this world not just be overwhelmed by disinformation and misinformation and the type of uh, you know, crime and, and entertainment uh, journalism that, that Maria was also talking about. Thank you. So a, a two-part question. Uh, one part, uh, the second part is going to be to, to ask you both to talk about how you think of your work as investigative journalists as part of a broader community of practice in, in genocide and atrocity prevention. Before I pivot to that, though, I wanted to follow up on um, what you've both been talking about uh, in a more pointed way regarding the risks to journalists that have emerged in the new, the new media landscape, the new constellation. I mean, the Philippines, it's fair to say, is a democratically backsliding state, backsliding quite quickly. The United States, for many of us in the wake of the January 6th insurrection and the ongoing um, uh, dynamics in, in the Republican Party looking ahead to 2024 is also a democratically backsliding country. Democratic backsliding requires um, uh, a hostility toward open, uh, objective, uh, and courageous reporting. So in the case of the, so, uh, you know, that kind of reporting, especially from conflict zones, is by its very nature dangerous. Reporters get killed. Uh, in, and they get injured in, in conflict reporting. We have the uh, Reporters Without Borders uh, says that 24 uh, uh, journalists have killed, been killed so far just in 2021 uh, to add to a, a, a very, very dangerous pr profession. But in democratically backsliding states, there's a new kind of danger, which is the deliberate governmental targeting. Um, of, of independent news sources to close them down, to eliminate them entirely, and to um, make it so that that is no longer an impediment to the consolidation of power. So obviously, Maria, you know more about this than you'd like. Uh, I, I wanted you to speak a bit more pointedly to, to, to that. And Nick, I wanted to know whether you see that kind of development um, in the wings uh, for us here in the United States as we take a, a pause in this Biden administration and get ready for what's going to be 
one hell of a 2024 presidential campaign. Um, yeah, Nick, do you want to go first? Or I know we're ping ponging, so um, I, so what I've seen in the Philippines, and I and I'll go back again to the the pipelines, the our nervous system, which is the information that kind of holds us together, and the 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 way they're distributed, right? So part of what we've seen is that the the algorithms of the tech platforms have this vulnerability that's been uh, that authoritarian style leaders, dictators to be uh, uh, have taken advantage of. And we saw this, you know, Putin and the, the IRA and the GRU in 2014 at, in the Ukraine and then in 2016 in the United States and continuing. So there's that, that um, information operations. It's part of the Russian military doctrine. Um, but beyond that, what I've lived through in the Philippines is, you know, I had 10 arrest warrants in less than two years. And this, in, this is my 35th year as a journalist, and I've never lived through anything like this. Uh, President Duterte in 2016 was democratically elected. And I have seen kind of like the, the, the crumbling of, of the institutions from within. Um, we are the smallest of the, he, he targeted the largest newspaper, the top, the largest television network, it's the news group that I came home to manage. And then, and we're, I suppose, we're the largest digital only news site, right? But I have a big mouth, I didn't stop talking. And I just kept, we just kept reporting. Um, he, for the first time in 14 years, the last time ABS-CBN went dark, ABS-CBN is the largest network in the Philippines, was 14 years ago, when Ferdinand Marcos like literally declared martial law and shut them down. You can do that now without declaring martial law. You don't have to have tanks rolling in the street. Democracy dies with a gavel in a courtroom by, by turning, using the law against, it's, it's called lawfare, but you know weaponizing the law. So we have a senator who had investigated the killings of that were associated with, with President Duterte, both in Davao City when he was still mayor and uh, after when he began the drug war. She's been in prison. She's serving her fifth year in prison. Uh, drug charges that human rights activists say are trumped up. She's never really had her day in court. Um, and so, you know, things can get worse. The level of violence has increased, the level of fear. And with, when you add coronavirus to the mix, the level of uncertainty and the isolation Filipinos feel, right? So all of this has, has allowed President Duterte to consolidate power using the same social media platforms. Like I said, we're heading to elections and the closer we get to the end of the six year term of President Duterte, the more vocal Filipinos have become. So we'll see where that goes. But this isn't a Filipino problem alone. We are seeing this in many parts of the world. You know this, right? And the, the biggest problem is, you know, how do you define genocide, right? Or mass atrocity? I mean, it was easier. Hitler and Stalin, they were democratically elected as well, right? And then they did, it's almost like we're seeing back to the future in different ways. And um, Asia has had our own mass atrocities in Indonesia, uh, when President, when Suharto came to power, we still have no idea. I think the US sets that number killed at almost 2 million people. Then you have uh, the Khmer Rouge, that was, that was finishing as I was, as I was reporting out of Indonesia, those trials. Now, the biggest casualty in our battle for facts, our battle for truth in the Philippines is how many people were killed in the drug war? How many people have died in this administration? This year alone, you know, the level of killings of activists increased. In one Sunday, we call it Bloody Sunday, police barged into the homes of nine activists. They had police warrants, search warrants, I mean, arrest warrants, but they killed the nine activists they were supposed to have arrested. Um, and we're still waiting. Look, the ICC has said it's be going to begin a formal investigation. And of course, this is part of what the government is. And I will shut up but, because I can talk about this stuff forever. But I, I'll say, I'll toss this to Nick this way, which is, you know, um, I opened the Jakarta Bureau in 1995 with Peter Arnett. 
And one of the most interesting things I've learned from Peter Arnett, he was he was working for the AP during the Vietnam War, and he broke this story where, you know, it was, I think a, a general was talking to him and he wrote it in his AP dispatch, how they had to destroy the village to save it. That was it, that that one quote, right? And and then, then after that, I watched him go through the Gulf War, and then I watched him go through Operation Tailwind, which is, again, about journalists to a degree, but also how conflict and power and journalists interact. It is far more difficult today because power can be much more insidious. It can affect our minds without us realizing it. And the as you can see, I'll push one last time. You know, these are American social media platforms that they're doing it through. But I'll kick it to, to Afghanistan's a whole other thing. And my 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 relationship to that is, you know, the 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 quote terrorists, the people who were trained in Afghanistan, in, uh, leading to the group that we would later know as Al Qaeda. But, Osama bin Laden's brother-in-law came to Southeast Asia, to the Philippines in 1988 and began funding charities. And those veterans from the Afghan war came back to the Philippines and they were part of what we would call Jama Islamiyah, which is, was essentially Al-Qaeda's arm in Southeast Asia. Regardless of how you look at it, whether it is old war or the new information war, we are connected. And so I guess, you know, it still comes down to please do something about those social media platforms. <laughs> sure. Um, again, it's tough to follow and it's, it's, it feels slightly ridiculous talking about uh, you know, the, the difficult media environment with someone like Maria who receives something like a hundred threats an hour, I think was, was the number I remember seeing. And, um, but, you know, it, it is an exceptionally difficult media environment. And in the United States, I mean, the last administration calling reporters the enemy of the people. I mean, this is this is how it, it starts, right? I mean, this is this is uh, you know how you engender this uh, you know animosity towards the press and erode credibility. And you know, it. Um, now, I think I think again it comes down to strengthening the institutions, and I th I think you have to find ways of journalists, uh, you know, fighting for each other's rights, protecting each each other, so that we can uh, get the public the information it needs. You know, uh, Nadia is talking a, a bit about uh, you know my reporting in Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, whether I'm there or South Sudan or Burkina Faso. A lot of times. Um, in these environments, local journalists want to tell the type of story that I'm there to tell, but uh, they're facing challenges that are, are far beyond those that, that I face. Uh, they're facing, you know, uh, the, the real possibility of arrest, indefinite detention, disappearance, or even death. Uh, you know, to some degree, I face those too, but uh, but I I have a, a lot more protections as a foreign journalist as an American passport holder, as someone with this white skin privilege, uh, you know, it's, it's much, much less easy for, for foreign governments to take that kind of action. Uh, I could be roughed up, I could be thrown out of the country, but, uh, but you know, I'm able to, you know, to, to do this type of reporting. And a lot of times I see that as, as my role, that I, I believe that the local reporters could do a better job uh, and, but, uh, but they're constrained in, in ways that, you know, it's, it's a, a grave threat to their life. And that's why I often work with uh, local journalists, you know, and, and co-report. Uh, they often do not want their, their names affiliated with the story, but they want these stories out there because they believe in the, in the power of journalism. They believe that if these stories can be told, uh, you know, outside the country, that, you know, the, the free information ecosphere, uh, you know, will eventually help and get them to the point where, you know, they're in a, in a country where they can report the news accurately and independently. Thank you. I wanted to go to uh, uh, some of the uh, online questions that are, that are now uh, starting to populate here. And, and Maria, I know that you don't have a whole lot of time, so uh, we'd like to, we'd like to, um, to go to you first. 
So this is a, a two-parter from um, a student of mine, actually, Eliza Klingler, who's a senior here at Binghamton University. And she's, she's asking a question in the context of the, uh, the, the news from this week that Bong Bong um, Marcos has now entered the presidential race and had, in fact, uh, considered um, uh, asking Duterte to be his running mate. Um, so with that question in mind, I'll, I'll read the second part of the question that she's asking. Uh, and she writes as follows, let's just read it out. In, in 2019 in the United States, uh, there was a protest against Duterte, which revived the saying Tama na sobra na from Corazon Aquino's campaign against the Marcos dictatorship. Uh, you spoke, you, uh, Maria spoke briefly on this, but in terms of opposition in the Philippines itself, what parallels have you seen between Philippine social opposition to Duterte as it was seen against Ferdinand Marcos in the 1980s during the People's Power Movement? Thank you so much for the question. Um, it's interesting that just struck me today because today uh, our vice, the vice president, Lenny Robredo, who heads the opposition, uh, declared her candidacy for the presidency, right? So Bong Bong Marcos was yesterday, Lenny Robredo today. And you know that to me is like a little bit of a throwback Ferdinand Marcos and Cory Aquino, um, you know, kind of soft-spoken. Of course, Lenny is a lawyer, but it's interesting, again, um, let me answer it this way. Uh, I was thinking about this yesterday, you know, and I've been talking about this battle for facts. For Ferdinand Marcos Jr., for Bongbong Marcos to win the presidency, right? this is the 35th year after people power ousted his family. They were forced to flee the Philippines and they fled to Hawaii, as you know. Um, uh, 35 years later, his son uh, filed his certificate of candidacy. He's going to run for president. It, it shows you the resilience, the political resilience of this family. Um, uh, but this kind of the durability of the family is also aided by a massive disinformation network that Bong Bong Marcos began in 2015. Uh, and that is massive, both on Facebook and YouTube. We've actually chronicled this, and I'll tweet it after um, a three-part series to look at the data of how this happened. He's very big on YouTube. And what this is, again, is half-truths, because in order for Bong Bong Marcos to win, he has to tweak history. He has to bury the dark years of the dictatorship of his father. So, you know, this, when I say it's a battle for facts, in this case, it's erasing history. You know, what one church group here called historical denialism. And that's also, again, why Facebook, YouTube, why these American companies are playing such a massive role in our elections. That's, that's one. And then I think in terms of the opposition, look, um, under Duterte, it's been, he's actually been much better than Ferdinand Marcos in the sense that, you know, he didn't have to declare martial law to gain power in this, in a way. I think President Duterte has been the most powerful uh, leader that, the, that this country has had, but every institution, the checks and balances essentially collapsed within six months of him taking power because he was brazen in, in carrying out um, patronage politics. He felt, you know, he, when he appointed someone, he didn't feel like he needed to hide that it was because of political largesse. He owed somebody, so he appointed him. He may not be qualified for the post, that doesn't matter. So feudal politics is back in force, and today is really the first day to see what the opposition can do. But, you know, if you look back in 2019, the opposition was clobbered for the very first time since the Commonwealth days when America, we were a former colony of the, uh, the United States. Um, from the, no opposition senator won in our midterm elections in 2019. And the last time that happened was in our Commonwealth days. So let's see what shapes up, right? Uh, I think very similar to President Trump, the this administration's reaction to COVID or lack of it, right? That it's inability to manage, um, it's not, it's managing the virus like you could shoot it. We have strict curfews, we have checkpoints and those checkpoints wind up being vectors for, for infection as well. You can't shoot the virus. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. It's 
certainly going to be a very interesting campaign period. Yeah, I can't help, uh, Maria, I know that your time is short, but I can't help trying to sneak one last question into both of you before you go and, and have Maria uh, take the first turn and Nick at the second. And this is a question that, that parallels the one that I had been hoping to ask as well. It comes from Devin Terrell, who's the program officer for journalism and media at the Stanley Center uh, for Peace and Security. Uh, and, and Devin writes, given the challenges in the current information environment, do you, both of you, know of any research or case studies that show that supporting or strengthening journalism can help to prevent genocide and mass atrocities? Uh, studies. So, so for me, absolutely. I, you know, I have, we have three pillars that we follow and I try to take that 24 hour day and break it up with Pareto's principle to where you can get the most impact, right? And our, our three pillars are, as no surprise, technology. And I'll put that first, because if I can't reach you with the facts, then we, it doesn't matter. It's like preaching in an empty church. So technology, journalism, community, those are our three pillars. The, the tech part, I push for legislation. You know, it's, it's really important that we do something about it. And we, we deal with the tech by doing these stories and then, and then saying, you've got to do something about this. Um, the journalism part is critical because the business model has crumbled. I, I run, I handle the business and tech of Rappler. And um, in a strange way, don't repeat this please. I'm going to just say it. I have to thank President Duterte because by attacking us in 2017, 2018, the government tried to shut us down by taking away our license to operate. That was January. By April, you know, our advertisers got calls to, to not advertise. We dropped. So it was fear of our ad from our advertisers dropped almost 50% of our revenues by April. So we would have shut down. This war of attrition would have bankrupted us. But what we did is we, in April, we spent two, three weeks really pulling together what were we doing for Rappler? How are we, this, the, I, the way we take apart disinformation networks, um, the processes that we had put in place, looking at network analysis and then using natural language processing to figure out the messaging that is being sent out by the disinformation networks. Um, companies need that. Anyone needs that in the age of social media to try to understand how you, we're being manipulated. So we splintered it off and, and built another sustainable business model. That business model grew 2000%. So, you know, if we hadn't been pressed as hard as we were, would we have been as resilient? I'm not sure. I, would, I wouldn't want to do this over again, but you know what? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Nietzsche is right. So, so um, and then the last part of community, right? Journalists, news organizations have not been that great at building community because our model in the past was, you know, kind of like, the disinterested, we just tell the story. But really to have effective change, and this goes back to the theory of change for every news organization, in, um, you have to build these communities of action. That was the elevator pitch of Rappler in 2011. We build communities of action. And the food we feed our communities is journalism. Journalism is critical because the facts are critical. And when it is a battle for facts, journalism becomes activism. Um, and the last thing I'll say about journalism is to help, right? Because I, I really feel like, you know, when I get very frustrated in the Philippines, I look at how we can help other news organizations survive this. So I actually just became, I took a position. Um, they just announced this last week, the Mark Thompson, who's the former CEO of New York Times, and I are the new co-chairs of this new fund, it's called the International Fund for Public Interest Media, uh, the, we hope to get off the ground. And what, what the aim of that is to raise a billion dollars a year to be able to, and, and from new funds, right? ODA is actually what, we, what we're targeting, overseas development assistance. 0.1%, 0.1% of ODA is spent on independent, on media, on journalism. And journalists need help during this time period. And what we're nudging democratic countries to do is to set aside even 0.5%. You know, if you can get that to 1%, that's, then you can help. Our target is to be able to help independent media survive 
particularly in countries in the global south. So there's a lot to be done. And, and you know, for you guys watching, like the best part about this time period, every time I see the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention, you know, this is like, we, these are the things we want to prevent. In order to have that, you have to have journalists to hold power to account. And the, the crazy thing is that now, everything in our world is being reorganized, recreated, and you're part of it. So, you know, it's like a man-to-man -man defense on social media or woman-to-woman -woman defense. And that means we need you. <laughs> so, sorry. No, thank, thank you so much, Maria. And I, I, I know you have to, to run. Um, so we're so appreciative of your time. Um, and I'm going to keep going right away with with Nick to kind of pull you in on this um, on this question and ask you to reflect on the places where you have worked um, dating back to Vietnam it's looking at the the records in kind of an archival way um, but also um, ongoing atrocities in the other countries that you um, right up until COVID started um, spent a lot of time in and and are you do you see examples there or elsewhere where, I'm gonna add, elaborate a little bit on the question um, from Devin at the Stanley Center that Max um, shared with us. We know that um, attacks on the media and repression of the media is a warning sign for, and, and raises the risk of, of mass atrocity. But do you know of examples where active strengthening of the media has actually contributed to um, helping to, to lower those risks and potentially prevent atrocities. Yeah, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, I think I have seen some academic studies in the past, but, uh, you know, I, <laughs> of course, I'm not able to, to cite them off the top of my head. And I'd be happy to try and track those down and, and send them after. But I think that, um, you know, I, th I think, as you said, this is, um, you know, the, the, when you erode press freedom, and this is this is one of the the warning signs, and and you see it, and um, you know, and and certainly uh, the places that that I've worked, and you know, when when I've been engaged in uh, you know investigation of atrocities, it's often in media environments where there's not a free press, or uh, you know, there there's a, a, a press that's uh, it's unable or, or uninterested in looking into these, uh, you know, into, into something. You know, I'm, I'm reminded my work on the, the Vietnam War. Now, uh, you know, I got into the uh, post-conflict work on Vietnam, investigating atrocities decades after the fact, because I found uh, records in the US National Archives uh, that were uh, very detailed investigations done by army criminal investigators uh, who investigated allegations put forth by active duty GIs during the Vietnam War and recently returned Vietnam veterans who you know, wanted to expose what was going on, uh, but the army took these records and buried them for decades. So when we came out after the fact, the public wasn't able to get this information and make a uh, you know, make decisions about the, the war based upon what was actually going on on the ground. And so they got a sanitized version of it. Um, and, you know, at the time in Vietnam, uh, there were a lot of journalists who uh, witnessed uh, war crimes, atrocities being carried out by the United States. And sometimes these, these would, many times actually, be in articles, but they wouldn't be framed as an atrocity, as a war crime, because at the time, uh, and, you know, I'm sad to say sometimes I think this continues to this day. Uh, they didn't know enough about the, the laws of war. They didn't know enough about international humanitarian law as it stood at the time to know that what they were seeing was a crime and to put it into the context necessary for their reader. Uh, you know, Neil Sheehan, who broke the, the Pentagon Papers story, uh, before that he was a reporter in Vietnam. And, you know, he talked about in the 1970s uh, you know, finally understanding that, uh, you know, what he had seen early on in the 1960s, the United States troops doing on the ground were crimes. Uh, he'd even been in the army, but he didn't have the training, didn't have the background 
didn't put these things into stories or when it made it into the story, it made it sound like this was, you know, the, the way that wars are fought and this is legal behavior. And if you don't empower the public with this knowledge, if you don't provide the proper context, then, you know, governments are able to get away with this again and again. So I think it's, it's a matter of, you know, <laughs> having the press, uh, you know, out there able to document, but also having the background. Uh, and I think that's where, uh, you know, your center and, uh, and, and others in the field come in. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think there would be fruitful cross collaborations and, uh, and it's necessary to educate journalists, especially young journalists, because so often they're the, the stringers who are out in the field, you know, freelance reporters who end up covering these conflicts because there isn't money out there to do this and they're looking to make a name. But, uh, but they don't have the background. So, you know, it's a place where, you know, a center like IGMAP and, uh, and J schools, I think, could have a really fruitful collaboration in, um, you know, in, in advancing this knowledge and making sure that the stories we get have all the information that we need. Thank you. So just a, a quick follow up on that um, as well. Um, uh, oh, is, is Maria still there? I think with her with her wonderful mask on. I mean, um, uh, I mean, journalists, uh, uh, rightly so, have a have a long and storied ethics of independence, uh, of objectivity, of fairness, of 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 uh, verification of, uh, 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 and and uh, uh, I think that in, in some sense, thinking about journalists as part of a community of practice, uh, and and in in close collaboration with. Uh, academic centers or NGOs or things like that. I just wondered. I mean, I, I I'm wondering how you, Nick, as a as an as a you know a very active journalist who's who who's very independent, right? Uh, not only in the sense of how you get paid, but in the sense of how you think about your work, where you go next. I mean, what what matters to you? How do you think of? I mean, first of all, do you? Uh, uh, and second of all, how do you think of yourself? I guess as being part of a broader community of prevention practice, and how, and if so, how does that fit with um, what, from the outside, looks like a very noble and long-standing journalistic ethos, a professional ethics of independence? Uh, you know, I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, journalism does have this uh, in, in, uh, independent streak in it, and I, I, I think uh, you know it's it's always been, it's always meant a, a lot to me, and I've always, uh, you, know, you know, almost all my decisions are are based around that. But I think, uh, I still think that there's uh, you know really fruitful cross collaboration that's possible, um, and. Now, as I was saying, I think I think it's it's a matter of uh, you know educating ourselves. I think sometimes uh, this independence has been to to our, our, our detriment. The, the idea that you can just go out there you know, alone in, in some way and uh, you know make sense of it on your own. Um, you know, and I, I think I think a lot of us uh, you know you, you you go into to environments to try and uh, educate yourself as as much as possible beforehand, but um, you know, a lot of that is dealing with uh, you know educating yourself on the uh, the country and you know its backstory and you know the the nuts and bolts necessary for your reporting. But um, I think there are these these overarching themes uh, you know in academia that can can help us you know can provide frameworks for understanding things in different ways and. Um, and delivering those to to our readers, you know, like I was talking about with this this context, and I think there are fields of knowledge out there that uh, that journalists are, you know, perhaps just ignorant of. Uh, you know, you feel a lot of times uh, that you're already overwhelmed by information, but um, you know, having these different frameworks, being able to see the story in in different ways, uh, you know, consulting with with experts who.
looks like Nick, uh, uh, Nick's Zoom uh, has frozen for a minute. Uh, so uh, while we see if we can get him unstuck, um, uh, I, I'll uh, talk a little bit about what I would love to ask Nick next uh, with, the, uh, with the hope that, that I can, because this is a point that I think has come up very often uh, in, in many different uh, conversations that we've been having with Nick here at the Institute with our students and, and faculty over the, over the last um, uh, four days that he's been busy uh, here. And, and, and it has to do with this. I mean, Nick's reporting over the last, um, over the last uh, uh, five years or so has been almost exclusively in uh, conflict zones in Sub-Saharan Africa. And he's been drawn there uh, uh, in part because uh, the, 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 in, the, the sense that these are simply underreported, um, but also in a sense that he's been fascinated to discover just how large the, the, the footprint of the uh, of American covert war on terror operations have been in those conflicts, and so uh, I, I'm referring specifically to some extraordinary reporting that Nick has done over the last five years. From first of all, from South Sudan. Uh, 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 secondly, from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, third, from Libya, and most recently, where he was right up until the um, right up until the, the the pandemic hit of Burkina Faso. And so the question, which I'm being deliberately long-winded about, uh, is that, you know, these are countries that, um, there is Nick, so these are countries where you've been reporting from for the past few, few years, uh, Burkina Faso, South Sudan, the DRC. These are ongoing active war zones, but they're also countries that have miserable records on, on press freedom for the most part. So what I, what I wanted to, to have you talk to us about, Nick, and again, this is something that we've been talking about here for days. How do you think through the idea of you as a, as a white American with a, a, a passport and a certain kind of protection interacting with and, and um, collaborating with local journalists in war zones, in whether it's Burkina Faso, South Sudan, or the DRC, how do you, both on a practical, but also on a, let's say, on a professional ethical level, how do you negotiate with your positionality as a, as a, as a white person, as an American, versus theirs who are trying to report on conflicts that are happening in their own countries? Yeah, thank you. And sorry about the technical difficulties there, perils of technology. But um, yeah, I think this is always a, a negotiation. I mean, um, you know, for, for many years in journalism, um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's an overstatement to say there, there had been a very, you know, colonialist relationship. Uh, the idea of a journalist and a, and a fixer, uh, you know, who's your, your guide and, and translator. And I think, I think the profession has, has been moving away from this and, and trying to embrace the idea of co-reporting. Uh, and, and so often that's what it, it always was. Uh, you know, you might have uh, the, the Western reporter, the foreign correspondent have access to, you know, these large foreign media markets and uh, know how to frame stories for them. But uh, you were dependent on, on the local knowledge of, uh, of someone, an interlocutor who was, uh, knew the local landscape. And often that was a local journalist. And often uh, that's who we're working with today. Uh, I'm working with a local journalist, but you know, as I, I mentioned when when Maria was here, a lot of times in these environments, it's just too dangerous for local reporters to say all they want to. They're you know extremely skilled. Um, you know, they they want to do this work. Uh, they have the stories, and often you'll find that they, you know, they you know, sometimes you get stories from them. They 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 give you the story because they know that uh, that you have a venue, you have a platform. And they'll work with you. Uh, you know, you you offer credit, but generally they say, "Don't put my name anywhere near this story." They want plausible deniability with this. They, um, they want to be able to distance themselves from from you and from the reporting. Uh, what they want is for the story to get out. And you know, at the moment in places like this, this is often the best conduit uh, to get it published outside. You know, even if we're an American audience, eventually it will filter back and hopefully, uh, you know, begin to have the effects to, to allow them in the, the future to, 
you know, write the, the stories as fully as they want to. So Nick, I want to follow up on, you mentioned a couple of times opportunities for the need for more collaboration between journalists and, and the academic community. And in the context of atrocity prevention and the work of IGMAP in particular, you know, we think of, we, we know that mass atrocities are not isolated events, they are long processes, um, and that um, prevention too often is narrowly associated with intervening during active um, violence, um, active killing, and, and where the options are, are limited, they're costly, um, and, and in, for many people, um, it's already too late. Um, although it's still obviously necessary, then um, it's not necessarily the ideal time. We, and we refer to that as kind of the midstream um, intervention. We also talk about, uh, and clearly you're reporting in Burkina Faso, Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan falls into that category. Your earlier reporting that you talked about um, regarding the, the archival research um, regarding Vietnam and massacres there um, falls into the downstream category of how can we you know, engage in forensic investigation after the fact and hopefully use that um, as part of investigations and um, truth and justice processes, but also to inform future action. At the Institute, we're really um, trying to encourage more attention on upstream rather than just midstream and downstream prevention. But that given the current environment in which, as, as Maria talked about, um, so much emphasis is placed on likes and shares and anger and outrage, and what you have talked about a little bit today, but also more over the past couple of days with us um, of the, the challenge for a, a freelance um, reporter in particular to get major publication outlets to invest in stories and to care about um, even ongoing atrocities. What are the chances and, and what is it, would it look like for investigative reporting that could focus more upstream on reporting the early warning signs of impending violence or the potential to escalate to violence um, when it's so hard to even get the, the midstream. Yeah, uh, there, there are a lot of threads there, but um, you know, one thing comes to mind, it was uh, my reporting trip last year, you mentioned uh, to Burkina Faso. And this is one where I, I had uh, collaboration with the uh, academic institution, it was uh, Brown University's Cost of War project. Uh, they were interested in, in looking uh, closely at uh, US uh, security assistance in West Africa. And you know this is something that I've reported on in the past. The United States has pumped a lot of money into the region uh, in an effort to you know, quote unquote, stabilize it, uh, bolster militaries there. So, uh, you know, one of one of the Brown researchers, co-director of Cost of War, Stephanie Savell, uh, and I you know, put together a project where we both went and reported, uh, or worked alongside each other. Uh, I was doing uh, reporting, you know, she was doing academic work. Uh, we interviewed together, you know, in the capital with uh, uh, displaced persons, uh, war victims, uh, experts, analysts there, and then I also went further out in the field uh, to do reporting on the ground closer to the front lines. Uh, I think that, um, you know, you know, together we strengthened each other's work. Um, you know, but one of the interviews we did together in the Capitol, uh, you know, it was with uh, the head of the ruling political party. And, you know, I, I think, you know, he had not been giving any interviews to journalists, uh, local or foreign. But um, when he heard that uh, an academic was interested in speaking with him, uh, you know, he felt a little freer about it. And she said, can I bring along my friend? He's a journalist. And you know, I, was, I was able to come along and get an interview that, um, that you know, had been you know, almost impossible for, for anyone to get. And he was, he was very candid. Um, you know, I, I asked him about uh, allegations that the, the government of Burkina Faso was uh, engaging in extrajudicial killings. Uh, you know, this isn't something that I expected that uh, that he would admit to, but he did in that interview. He admitted that it was going on. He just said something like, uh, Shh, "No, we don't want to share that." But 
you know, we were on the record. He knew I was a journalist. And, um, you know, it was it was the first official admission that had been made. And, you know, I, I think, you know, <laughs> you know, this is someplace where a collaboration like this, it, it works and it can get that information out there. And, you know, it's as, as a journalist, I think this is the, the best that I can do is to ferret out the information as best I can, shine a spotlight on it and put it out. You know, this was eventually published in the, the New York Times Magazine. Uh, so it, you know, it, hopefully it's a, it's a, it's a big platform and it gets in front of the right people. You know, it's, it's my, uh, you know, hopefully the state department takes a look at that, takes a look at the emissions. Uh, you line that up with, uh, the reporting that I did with investigative reports by NGOs, uh, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, who have also documented that type of thing. And <laughs> you hope that there's a realization in the US government that this is the military that we're pumping money into. This is where it's going. Uh, there's the reason why uh, as the US security aid has gone into to West Africa uh, at an exponential rate, the number of terrorist attacks, number of fatalities, number of terrorist groups operating there have all spiked exponentially. I'm not saying that uh, correlation is causation, but it then deserves uh, a really hard look. And uh, you know you have to, have to say that these metrics are going in the wrong direction. Nick, I wanted to, to ask you a, a, a more fine-grained question about the, the work that you do. And, and I'm particularly thinking of the work that you've, you've done in Sub-Saharan Africa over the last uh, few years. Um, the, uh, the book on um, South Sudan, Next Time They'll Come to Count the Dead, and for you uh, Binghamton students out there, that book is available uh, as an ebook through the library. Uh, and in particular, a much more recent, the, the recent piece in the New York Times Magazine on Burkina Faso, and the, the piece on the uh, otherwise virtually unpublicized ethnic cleansing campaign in the DRC called um, A Slaughter in Silence, which we'll post a link to down below. Um, one of the qualities, we've been reading your work all week, and one of the qualities of your work that's really quite extraordinary is the, the, the attention that you pay to uh, when you interview victims and survivors, the attention that you pay to not just what they say, but how they say it or how they try to talk, how they are, um, you know, the, the the quality of their voices, their sometimes their inability to, or or the the difficulty or the pain that they have in 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 expressing themselves, uh, which is very it, itself, I, I think, a very important part of of the, of the interviewing process. Talk to us a little bit about how a, a working professional conflict zone journalist thinks through the way that you balance the need to get objective, reliable information on the one side, and on the other side, the way that you need to acknowledge and understand that these are deeply wounded, uh, traumatized uh, people who, are, who have experienced tremendous loss. Um, how do you think, I mean, what goes on in the mind of an investigative journalist from a conflict zone in trying to, in trying to pursue both of those at once? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it's it's uh, really it's a, it's a, a, a delicate situation when you're there, and it's something early in my career uh, I didn't have a, a, a good knowledge or appreciation of um, just how traumatizing this can be for your interview subjects. Uh, it it wasn't um, you know I'm 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 sorry to say that it wasn't high on the agenda uh, in the field of journalism. I feel like within the last 10 years, there's finally been an acknowledgement. And in the last maybe five years, there's been uh, real high quality trainings available. Uh, but, you know, only for, you know, small numbers of journalists, I think a, a, a select few, I'm sure some people have figured this out on their own. But I think, uh, I think there's a, a real need for this uh, within the profession because you're dealing with people who have gone through extreme trauma and, you know, I think too many times in the past we've sort of parachuted in and asked really pointed questions and tried to draw out information that we thought was important uh, to fit, you know, our own frameworks for stories. And you know, what what I try to do now is um, it makes it difficult for freelancers because it's it's time intensive journalism. 
but to uh, spend a lot of time with people and let them, uh, you know, let the, the stories come out at their, their own pace. Uh, when you do this type of work a lot, um, you know, you notice gaps in stories. And I think for, for journalists who are looking to pin down details, uh, these are the places that in the past you might pick at uh, and, and try and drill down on it. But uh, these gaps are there for a reason. That they're tough parts that, that people are, are trying to make sense of in their, their own mind, come to grips with. And uh, I think what you need to do is give them the, the time and space to tell the stories, sometimes in very circular or, or meandering ways, uh, you know, because you want to get the story as fully as possible. Uh, and, but you don't want to put people through needless trauma. And uh, you want to make it clear because the, the power dynamics are so skewed, you as an outsider coming in, uh, you know, uh, let people know that they can disengage from the interview at any time, um, take a break whenever, end it for the day. I can always come back later. And you know, it, it's it's also about reading the person that you're you're interviewing. And you, so many times, I think in the past we've we've been so uh, intent on on getting the story and taking your notes that you're not paying close attention to the person. And this is something you really have to do. You really have to read the physical signs and see if, if someone is associating or if they're, uh, you know, that, that they're, they're having a problem and be able to step back, offer them some water, give them some time, change the subject, sometimes talk about something that's innocuous. And, uh, and, and if you get back to that part of the, the, the interview, you know, that's fine. If not, they need to to go to, um, to 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 let people go on their way and don't make it them feel as if they're they're obligated to you or must tell these stories. So, you know, and and you mentioned you know bringing in, uh, you know, what it's like when they're they're speaking with you, and I think that's such an important part. Um, you know, to give people an accurate uh, impression of of the, the trauma that people have gone through. And I, th I think it helps for, for readers uh, to, to identify people and see the, the shared common humanity and imagine yourself in their shoes. So I try to provide the, the detail and um, you know, I'm always grateful and humbled that people will walk a very hard road with me to tell their story. So um, when we initially um, advertised this um, webinar, we indicated that it was an hour and a half. And for some reason, when we sent out a revised version, uh, we, we listed it as two hours. But I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So I'm going to ask a, a last question and then kind of give you an opportunity to kind of pull things together. Um, as you're talking about... Um, you know, the, the need to balance um, the getting the information with being very respectful of the people that you're talking to and the trauma they've already experienced and not wanting to re-traumatize them. Um, and you're, you're reporting on um, events in places that many of your readers may not be familiar with. So you have a lot of information to provide, not only about the experience of the people who are, are being victims, but also the, the kind of the layers of legal and political and economic complexity, um, geographic complexity. And when you're talking about, um, you know, procedures of, you know, it, this might have been more applicable to Maria of, of the operation of the ICC or other international bodies. There's a lot of, of complexity, you know, what constitutes a crime against humanity um, or an extrajudicial killing or a war crime. Um, how do you determine who your audience is when you're writing about these things? Because the, the attention span and, and the interest in some of those um, details um, really varies depending on whether you're talking to the lay public or if you're trying to reach policymakers and move um, political action. Um, and we also have to, I think, combine this notion of attention and audience with what we know from psychologists like Paul Slovic and others, this concept of psychic numbing that that um, people, and the general public and policymakers have this capacity for attention and empathy and compassion for one or two individuals. But once you start talking about dozens, let alone tens of thousands, um, 
the, the capacity is, is greatly diminished, even though it should be greater because it's greater human suffering. How do you bring those things into your reporting and how you, how you write your stories? Yeah, again, it's, it's a real balancing act. And I think it goes back to, you know, what I was talking about with, with Max's question. It's, it's, um, you know, it, 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 you know, you need to put in, I think, uh, uh, to tell these stories properly, a lot of like work and talk to a lot of people. Uh, and, and I think there's a natural tendency then because people have, uh, have, have gone this extra mile and shared really traumatic stories with you that you want to put as many stories in as, as possible. And I think that can often be overwhelming to a, to a reader and often you don't have the, the luxury of, of space in a publication for it. So it's, it's a matter of finding stories that, uh, you know, with, with a, a, an interviewee that you think that readers can connect with, uh, who has an emblematic story that can stand in for a, a, a much larger one. Uh, I think a lot of times it's, it's really helpful to have a, a deeply personal story um, with great detail. And then, you know, you, you try to get in, you know, all the, the, the context that you can. Um, you know, and, you know, what I try and do in these circumstances is spend a lot of time on the ground and talk to a lot of people and be able to lay that out for a reader, make sure that they know that this wasn't, you know, put together by interviewing five people, but that it was interviewing hundreds of people at all different spots, uh, you know, at border crossings or uh, ID, uh, camps for displaced people or refugee camps, uh, that you're getting, you know, a, a very comprehensive picture, as comprehensive as, as I could do by talking to all these people. Here are a few examples uh, that, uh, you know, show that the types of stories that I'm hearing, but I'm hearing them from all over. So this, uh, you know, if I'm trying to show that it's a a systematic government campaign to, to clear villages and ethnic cleansing. Um, that's how I try and do it, but advance that story through, uh, you know, a few main uh, interview subjects whose stories I can tell in, in real depth and detail. Um, and then of course, bring in experts, bring in the numbers, uh, but I'm always, I'm generally writing for uh, you know, a, a general audience, general, American readership, U.S. readership, and uh, but but I, I also try and signal in there, um, you know, make sure that people have have the context necessary to know that this is ethnic cleansing and what ethnic cleansing is, and then you know when when you're looking to you're hoping that this makes a you know a, a political impact, um, you know a lot of times the experts that you're talking with are from government agencies or the United Nations and you know make it clear that you're 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 happy to share uh, information that that doesn't get into the uh, into the article that you know that a general audience wouldn't find useful but say a UN panel of experts would or uh, an NGO that's conducting their own investigation um, you know I'm always uh, you know I'm, I'm grateful for the assistance they give me and I'm always happy to uh, share whatever you know, uh, minutia, you know, to, to the general audience that might be, uh, you know, a necessity for their work. You should talk to these people. Here are the leads that I have. Uh, here's information that uh, I wasn't able to corroborate and put into my story, but I feel very strongly that this is, uh, this is uh, legitimate information and maybe you can chase down the leads that uh, I ran out of time or, or, or money to pursue. Well, that's our time, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to close things out now uh, after uh, I think a, a, a really engaging discussion with our two guests. Uh, thanks to Maria Resta, of course, from Rappler, who joined us um, remotely from the Philippines. Uh, and thanks especially to uh, Nick Terse, investigative journalist, uh, you can uh, see Nick's uh, uh, recent work in some of the links that we've dropped below, and you can download a lot of his recent journalism, especially from Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, through his website or through the website of The Intercept, where he works uh, frequently. Uh, Nick has been a great guest with us this week as a visiting practitioner. 
here at the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention. And we're very grateful to him for uh, all the work and, and conversations that we've had with him um, this week. And, and he still has a, the rest of the day to go. So we're gonna see how busy we can keep him. Um, uh, thanks uh, to everyone in the audience. Um, please uh, check uh, frequently the IGMAC website uh, which will be posted down below for updates on upcoming webinars and other events that may be of interest to you. Uh, and with that, uh, 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 good afternoon, good morning, uh, or good evening, everybody. And, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you also to the staff behind the scenes making this happen. Yes, thank you all.